Ben. So okay then. Uh, this class is uh, dedicated to the memory of my father whose birthday it is today. I hope you people don't mind my doing it. He was my hero. So I'm doing that. But that's about it. I'm not going to say anything else. Uh, so let's get back to Aristotle. And uh, the point that I was making about Aristotle is that uh, people consider him to have studied constitutions. And please remember that constitutions is not a word that can be used in the case of uh, ancient Greece. Uh, neither can it be uh, used uh, sorry, what happened to Rachna? Hmm. Sorry. Uh, neither can it be used anywhere till the modern period. Uh, the whole idea of a constitution is a modern idea. And uh, please remember that uh, the laws that were followed uh, in most, uh, in quite a few city states, uh, sorry, not city states, sorry, police, P O L E I S, pronounced police, that is the uh, plural of polis. Uh, all these were either done under the command of an oligarchy or sometimes even a monarchy like uh, Macedonia, for example, uh, was a monarchy. And uh, if you look at uh, this uh, Sparta, then we have this uh, figure uh, who was actually considered to be the leader of some kind of an oligarchical system. Please don't use that aristocrat word here. Uh, this is Likurgus. Likurgus uh, and a few other people uh, as a group. So I'll just say with a group made uh, oral laws for Sparta. In the case of uh, Athens, um, you must understand uh, that uh, uh, in the case of Athens, it was prominent citizens who deliberated and gave decided the rules of social conduct. That's why it's called a democracy, but it is not really a democracy. Okay, it's a, a democracy is completely different. That is where everyone is involved in it. Not just a group of, not all citizens again, prominent citizens. Uh, it is lost in time, <clears throat> sorry, as to how uh, these prominent citizens were chosen or how they became prominent citizens that we do not know. Uh, 
so they decided uh, uh, the rules of conduct, social conduct. It's also called poetics of conduct. You will see that in Aristotle as well in his book, Poetics. Uh, so what we are looking at Uh, if you think we haven't finished the empirical part, we finished the normative part most definitely. Uh, I did uh, the second part of that was uh, empirical. Uh, now I can go back to that at a later stage in today's lecture. Okay, uh, um, um, one more, okay. okay. So we can go back to that again. Actually, uh, I'll do one thing with your permission. I'll do that in the evening class because that is where uh, empiricism will have to be discovered, uh, discussed. So I'll begin the discussion of behavioralism with empiricism. Is that all right? Okay, sir. Yeah, because you can't discuss behavioralism without discussing empiricism. So, yes. uh, so we'll talk about empiricism Normative is over. I hope you've understood that. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the empirical part, I'll do it in the evening. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so prominent citizens, how were they chosen? We have no idea. But this is what has led people to comment on the fact that it was some kind of a direct democracy that was uh, at work in uh, ancient Greece, which is really not the case. There was no direct democracy. And like I told you, when we did the typologies of uh, government, uh, what I told you is that they saw a degenerative cycle and uh, unfortunately uh, many interpreters and especially if you people are going to be reading uh, O.P. Kauba, you just might uh, get a, a feeling uh, that uh, Plato's ideal republic and uh, uh, that is seen as an aristocracy. Okay, it's not an aristocracy. It is a rule of the philosopher king segment of society. It's not an aristocracy. Aristotle uses some word which has been translated into aristocracy in his typology. And I told you <clears throat> that uh, I'm severely handicapped. Uh, by not knowing the uh, by not knowing the Greek alphabet and the, the ability to read it. So I have to depend on someone else uh, to translate that and all the translations basically say uh, all the translations basically claim that it was uh, aristocracy, but I don't think, I'm not sure if that is a correct translation. So please do be uh, careful about that uh, whole thing. Uh, you can write in Aristotle, but please don't write it in the context of Plato. Okay. <clears throat> and some of them also make a comparison with the Indian caste system. Uh, some of them use the caste system. It is not a caste system. It is a meritocracy. Uh, and in both 
Aristotle and Plato, what we are trying to see is when they are uh, talking about, uh, in the case of Plato, the ideal republic, uh, which actually is the ideal politia. I hope you remember that uh, uh, politia, that's how it is supposed to be pronounced. So the ideal politia got translated as race. Some translations will say publica, some will simply say public. In Latin, both are uh, acceptable. So whether you read it as race publica or race public, uh, either of the translations is fine, but that is what gets translated into English as the Republic. But this Republic is not at all a Republic of the variety that we have in the modern period. This is a primitive Republic and it is a Roman word, actually, technically speaking, we should be actually calling it only the politia. But unfortunately, what has happened is that since there are all translations of Plato's Republic, including the one by Barker, uh, who only says that uh, it is actually politia, he doesn't uh, actually find it another name. So he also uses the Latin translation as a result of which it's become the Republic. So we have no choice but to talk about it as a Republic. That is our uh, main problem because we have to talk about it as a republic given the fact that everybody uh, refers to it as a republic even greek uh, scholars of the greek language like barker they also use this particular translation which makes things extremely difficult for us but uh, otherwise it is supposed to be politia and even in the case of Aristotle, it is politia. It is the difference is where do you locate the politia and where exactly are you, what exactly are you attributing to the politia? That is what we need to understand. So, <clears throat> to come back to Aristotle, in the typology that we have seen, Aristotle is someone who has talked about, uh, who has talked about, uh, you know, let me put the typology here again. I'm not putting the uh, <clears throat> Plato's typology, or maybe I'll put it for comparison. In Plato, it is monarchy. Monarchy, again, not in the sense that we understand it. A monarchy is a single source of power. That's all. That's what it's a Greek word, actually, monarchy. So, you know, it's not a translation that we are trying to approximate. So, no, so it is a single source of power. I regret that we don't have the time to do Solon or Solon, as some people call him. Some people call him Solon. Uh, he was a very good example of a monarch. Uh, and uh, let's see if time permits at some point, maybe I'll do a bit of Solon with you. But not now. We don't have the time to do so long. Sir, is it Solomon or Solon? Hmm? Solomon. Not Solomon. 
Solon, S O L O N. Some people say Solon. Some people say Solon. I think it is Solon because Greeks have a tendency to drag the word, the last syllables. They drag them. Okay, so this is Plato, monarch. monarchy degenerating into a democracy which further degenerates into oligarchy and Uh oh oligarchy for him from here you go straight to democracy monarchy monarchy is a is an enlightened kind of rule not the philosopher king kind of enlightenment uh democracy is when <clears throat> the monarch is completely corrupted by the power that uh, he has and therefore doesn't rule for the well-being of the people uh oligarchy is uh, that which is uh, a group of people taking over from this uh now arrogant uh and uh, all powerful individual who has started ruling not keeping in view the well-being of citizens citizens uh is a word there <clears throat> and uh, when we talk about uh oligarchy so they are trying to restore some kind of thing but they to get uh, it's a group that gets corrupted over time and that is when the mob demos is a mob a very big group of people they take over and so plato called democracy a mobocracy okay and uh, it doesn't favor that at all right so for him the only good thing if you're looking at that kind of uh, a typology is to be found at the level of the monarchy and in the monarchy what he is saying uh, he when he talks about the ideal republic it is at the level of the monarchy that he wants he wants to stop this degenerative cycle and what he is trying to say is let's have the ideal republic there ruled by the philosopher king segment okay ruled by the philosopher king segment please don't call it class class is an economic denomination uh please don't call it caste it's a social denomination uh, neither of these are sorry about that the door was banging much to my discomfort uh, so what he wanted to do is he wanted to stop this degenerative cycle and hence he in the place of monarchy you should be having the politia the politia is the thing that he wanted in the place of that monarchy which is the rule of the philosopher king class and therefore uh it is something that uh, would be uh exempted from this unnecessary degenerative cycle because this would be enlightenment and i told you that 
he's also looking at the improvement of the race itself and that he's the first person to have used that term superman okay uh, which is normally attributed to uh, frederick nietzsche but it's not nietzsche nietzsche used it more vociferously than uh, uh, Plato, but it is Plato uh, who would be coining it. I don't, I haven't again found the Greek translation of it. The German translation of Superman is uh, Uber Mensch. Okay, U B E R, Uber M E N S C H. Uber Mensch is the translation that. Uh, is the is the word that is used by uh, uh, Nietzsche and which gets translated as Superman. I can't find the Greek equivalent of that. Again, due to my not knowing uh, the Greek alphabet mainly. Okay, so, so we have to rely on other people's translations. Uh, now, in Aristotle, this thing is different. It begins as a monarchy. Sir, yes, the sir. characters of uh, Superman in uh, Frederick Nietzsche's work and uh, Plato's work are different characters. Characters are different, but the concept. In what, what are you asking me? Please, I didn't get it. Are there any differences in character of uh, yes. Frederick Nietzsche's uh, Ubermensch and uh, Plato's uh, Superman? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, one, uh, basically there is a commonality. The commonality is that both of them believed that the human being in the form in which they were seeing is not the ultimate man. The ultimate man is that um, we have reached the highest form of development and we can't develop anymore. Okay, that is the ultimate man. So what, uh, because of the free breeding that he advocated in the uh, <clears throat> Philosopher King uh, segment. Uh, the characteristics are, uh, are, are that he said, this will lead to the betterment of the human race. It will lead to the betterment of the human race, but he doesn't cite an enemy. He doesn't cite an enemy. Uh, against whom he is using this particular uh, category of uh, Superman. Uh, but when uh, Nietzsche uses Ubermensch or Superman again, uh, it is uh, against the idea of an ultimate man, yes. So there is a commonality there with Plato uh, that the human being can improve. That is a commonality. The lack of commonality is that which would be in the form of, uh, what should I say? Uh, the lack of commonality is something which is in the form of Nietzsche having an enemy. Nietzsche sees the existence of an enemy. And who is the enemy for him? For him, the enemy is the Christian conception of man and God. You don't find this in Plato. Now, the way, if you read, does speak Zarathustra uh, by Nietzsche, it begins somewhere in the beginning 
he talks about this man running with a you know some kind of a candle in the daylight shouting god is dead god is dead okay and then somewhere he says it is time for the superman right now what nietzsche you have to put all his works or at least some of his works together you have to put some of his works together and uh, if you put that what picture do you get the picture that you get out of reading nietzsche is uh, if you read in the genealogy of morals for example he's talking about uh, he's that is written as a forisms i told you before a p h o r i s m s aphorisms are uh, those which uh, uh, are short pithy sayings so he's picked up a number of christian ideas okay and he rebuts them one by one he rebuts them one by one uh for example he says patience is seen as a virtue but he says patience is cowardice okay patience is cowardice inability to act not having the guts to take on your enemy or to take on time he says all these are nonsense these are not virtues these are indicative of a weak minded human being so the humanist component i hope you remember the humanist we talked about humanism the humanist component is extremely strong in nietzsche it's probably the strongest among all philosophers across time the humanist component i said even the sophists had a humanist component when we were doing plato and just before that when we talked about the sophists i talked to you about uh uh the, them being uh, uh there being a humanist component there and they they were the first to create a man centered or a human being centered universe which is of course some kind of an analogy it's not a literally instead of the sun there is a man there it's not that okay so <clears throat> so he is basically talking about uh the unnecessary celebration of jesus christ and to that extent he writes a book which is called antichrist in antichrist because uh you see the christians have this thing about an antichrist coming up at the instance of satan or the fallen angel lucifer not fallen the angel who is cast out of uh, heaven and on and went into hell and he takes away the souls of the people okay that is the kind of a thing so anybody who defied the bible was called an antichrist i don't know if you read uh, the quatrains of uh, nostradamus have you heard of nostradamus n o s t r o d a m u s no sir nostradam the damas was somebody from france okay and nostradamus i think he was 18th 19th century i can't remember please forgive me for that uh he wrote quatrains okay if you write something in two lines it's called a couplet 
And if you write it in four lines, then you have quatrains. So, if you look at the quatrains of Nostradamus, he also talks about the rise of the Antichrist. He also talks about the rise of the Antichrist. And he's actually looking at some kind of a situation wherein uh, it is like you've heard of Kalagnanam by Veera Brahmendra Swami. Anyone has heard of that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it is like that. The predictions of Nost Nostradamus are like the Kalagnanam, which is like, you know, predictions of the future. So in that, he also talks about the rise of the Antichrist. So you will find that G, uh, the whole system of Christianity, Nietzsche wanted to demolish, completely demolish it. So what does he do? He writes a book called Antichrist and he celebrates the Antichrist as the one that we should follow. And that is the Ubermensch or the Superman. Okay, and uh, if you also read his other book in conjunction with these three, Genealogy of Morals, Thus Peg Zarathustra, Antichrist, and if you read uh, his uh, other book, which is uh, Beyond Good and Evil, there he's questioning the entire moral system. Okay, and that is the reason why. He says morality is an invention of religion. It is an invention of religion to subjugate people and keep them subjugated. That is what he is basically saying when he is talking about uh, uh, morality. So when he wrote this book, Good Beyond Good and Evil, what he's trying to say is that these categories of evil and good have been created to put you into a certain way of thinking, to limit your potential, not uh, you know, fully realize your potential. So he's talking about all those things when he talks about uh, beyond good and evil. So he's rejecting the moral system. Okay, not all humanists have rejected the moral system. Like, for example, if you take the earliest uh, humanists, uh, like uh, Desiderius Erasmus, or uh, Ulrich uh, Zwingli, if you look at these people, these were men of the church uh, who were talking about the human potential. Unlike the rest of the church, they were more enlightened people who believed that there is a uh, great scope for the human being to achieve a number of things by using uh, his or her rationality. So these were men of church. So the earliest beginnings of modern humanism are through the men of church. So they are not anti-God. They are not anti-Christ. They are not anti-morality, which is all the things which is all these things as far as Nietzsche is concerned. That's why he's been called a madman. And that, please remember again, is something that comes from a Christian point of view. The criticism of Nietzsche 
as somebody who is a madman is a Christian point of view, exactly like how Leo Strauss and people like him, even David McLellan, uh, they talk about Machiavelli being a preacher of evil. Why? Because he wanted to separate politics from ethics. And he believed, it's not like he didn't believe in religion. I'll come to that when we do Machiavelli. He did believe in religion, but not in Christian religion. Okay. So anyway, next is that's where we're going after Aristotle. Uh, so what you need to understand, therefore, is that the preacher of evil title given is again from a Christian point of view. So please remember that. Okay. When somebody says this is a madman, why is he being called a madman? He's being called a madman because he's being different. He's questioning the very fundamentals of your beliefs. So Machiavelli and Nietzsche, that way, are similar. They have dug out the fundamentals of Christianity and said, this is no good. Both of them say the same thing. This is no good. Right? And Therefore, therefore, you must understand that Nietzsche's Superman is unlike Plato because there is an enemy against whom the Superman is rising. He said, God is dead. The Christian God, or the Christian conception of God is dead. He's antichrist. The teachings against the teachings of Jesus Christ. And he believed in the unlimited potential of the human beings to rise above the condition in which they are. Okay. So Nietzsche's Superman shares a similarity in sense that the human race can rise above still. It can rise further, according to both Plato and Nietzsche. They are similar there, but they are dissimilar that Plato's Superman has no opposition. He has no opposition, as in a supernatural entity like God, or a prophet, or anyone like that. And uh, he... Uh, is only talking about human beings rising higher. So there is that bit of the sophist in him. There is that bit of the sophist in him. So they are two similar yet dissimilar uh, versions of the concept of the Superman. I hope I have answered your question. Yes. Okay, so let's return to Aristotle. Monarchy. This gives way to tyranny. And then this comes in aristocracy. And this leads to now I'm going to put this in brackets. So 
So this is again a degenerative cycle of history. Begins monarchy good, tyranny is a corrupted uh, monarch. So people can't bear that rule. So a group of uh, well-meaning, Aristotle doesn't call them enlightened. He mean he calls them well-meaning citizens. Uh, they rise up against the tyrant. They get rid of the tyrant and they establish their rule, a group of people. The, how many are these in this group is not specified either by, uh, uh, what is his name, uh, Plato or by uh, Aristotle. Now Aristotle says that the aristocracy is not free from corruption. In due course, even aristocracy corrupts and when it corrupts, it becomes an oligarchy and and an oligarchy is a rule of a few corrupt uh, men. A few is like what I mean is not the whole of society. So this particular corrupt rule gives way to what we call uh, democracy. Okay then that is where, again, even in Aristotle, it is democracy that is mobocracy. So none of the Greeks, none of the Greeks favored a democracy. So then let's try to understand why did I put that in why did I put polity in brackets? Now, what Plato wanted to do was right at the top, he wanted to place the ideal republic rulers who would be the philosopher king segment. That is the politia, politia, sorry, politia is what he's talking about at the level of the monarchy. But Aristotle is not talking about them there. What Aristotle says is, when the oligarchy is something that is degenerating, he believed that the halting of the degenerative cycle, the halting of the degenerative cycle can happen again through politia. Politia is some kind of enlightened rule. But he's saying that let's not place it above oligarchy, above aristocracy, because he believed unlike, unlike Plato, please remember that one difference I talked to you when, in, when we started uh, uh, our discussion of Aristotle. Aristotle uses inductive reasoning as against deductive reasoning by Plato. Plato's deductions are all mathematical. Aristotle doesn't have mathematical deductions. He looks at society as an organism. Okay, once I finish with this and when I start explaining things to you about what he means 
by society is an organism that will become clear to you as we proceed further. Okay, he sees society as an organism. So for him, concentration of power in too few hands or just one hand is not a desirable thing because he believed that power would then corrupt people. It would corrupt people. So, Politia, though not his own idea, first used by uh, Plato, documented use. Other people, if they did, we don't know. Politia is polity. He called it the translation for that. Politia became polity not republic not republic this is a later translation and i am told that the earlier translations of aristotle's book politics also use the term republic uh, or, or race publica which was uh, latin but Later translations, which went directly to Greek, uh, to, to the Greek language, and not to uh, the more common Latin language, there they translated politia as polity. Okay, F D H Kito is one of those people. In fact, Kito says that one should not even refer to Plato's book as the Republic. One should call it Politia. He says, call it Politia. Why don't you call it Politia? Just call it Politia. He says, call it Polis. He's against city-state. FDH Kito, and he's an authority on a lot of things about ancient Greece. Okay, so his argument is, why do we have to approach through Latin? Why approach through Latin? Go straight to the Greek source. Bring it into English. In which case, what we are talking about, this is a term that Kinonia uh, Politike. Now, please translate it. It becomes political society. It doesn't become social, civil society. Because there was no polis, there was no politia, the Romans translated it into res publica. They translated quinonia politicae into civitas, uh, societas civilis. Okay, that's how they translate it. And today, we have this thing that non-governmental agencies that are working for development, this is the latest I'm talking about now. These are called civil society organizations and the institutions of government and the institutions of governance are called political society, which is exactly the opposite of Kenonia Politike. Political society is enlightened people living together and leading a commodious life. 
okay enlightened citizens leading a commodious life that is what kinanya politike literally means but look at what translations have done just look at what translations have done because people have used latin to translate into english rather than go to the greek thing itself and this in spite of this in spite of the schooling system that was there in england today we have lots of schools different types of schools we have uh, government schools and we have private schools and uh, in private schools we have christian missionary schools and then you have no 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 sorry uh so the basic thing is we have christian missionary schools formed by religious trusts we have minority schools for the muslims formed by their trust christian missionary schools don't call them minority institutions they don't call themselves that one has to really appreciate that all muslim educational institutions call themselves minority educating uh, uh, educational institutions and they take mainly people from their own religion unlike christian missionary schools that educate everyone right so we have that schools then we have the public schools which i told you is a very different thing in england and india from what it is in the us in the us the public school is a cheap school that is run by uh, the government uh, doesn't charge too much fees but by our standards even those are exorbitant but public schools in england became uh extremely expensive it was a public society that was constituted and that society would run the school so the two most famous uh public schools in england were eton and harrow e a t o n eton and h a r r o w harrow uh i think if i'm not mistaken nehru went to eton yeah i think he went to eton he went to one of these two schools uh that's why his english yeah. was... sorry uh, you said they are public schools no why they will charge this then why they will they will take fee that is because that society is a public society okay mm-hmm. publicly constituted not secretly constituted but openly and publicly constituted society all right so our idea of the public we are now calling our universities also public universities but technically we should be calling them government universities not uh, public universities because there's no holding of public money in the us both for public schools and for public university systems so state university systems the funds are derived through taxation which is given 
there is a tax even in India. I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, on income tax, depending upon your which level of income you are, there is at least a minimum 2% education cess, which is supposed to be to give free education to people uh, till the age of 14. What are we giving them now? I mean, government schools are there, but they don't, uh, let me not go into that. We are going into a totally different thing. So there are public schools and then there are grammar schools. In fact, all schools in England started as grammar schools. And one of the oldest Christian schools in Hyderabad, which is the St. George's Grammar School, simply called the Grammar School. Nobody calls it St. George's Grammar School. Okay, everybody calls it grammar school. When was it set up? I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was set up around the 1850s. Sometime around the 1850s was when that uh, particular school was set up. And it was set up by the Anglican Church, which had two branches in India. CNI and CSI, the Church of North India and the Church of South India. Okay. Uh, the headquarters of the Church of South India are in Medak. This is a Protestant church. It's a direct this thing of the Anglican Church. It was a branch of the Anglican Church till the British were here. Once they left and it, it is now an affiliate of uh, the Anglican Church. The Church of North India, God knows, it's disappeared. Huh? You try preaching Christianity up north, then the Khap Panchayat will catch hold of you and finish you. You can't preach there. So it flourished in, in South India. All Christians are in South India. No Christians are in North India. The Church of North India has ceased to exist. There's only the Church of South India. It has many institutions under its control. It's got the Wesley institutions. It's got the St. George's Grammar School. And all those many. I don't want to go into that right now. Anyway, so they had the concept of the grammar school. Why was it called the grammar school? Any idea? Some grammar schools have come up recently now. One which calls itself Johnson's Grammar School and some other things. So there was this extremely enlightened. I mean, I, I really have to. This is enlightenment at a completely different level. A level that I didn't believe existed. So we had this amazing colleague who is now retired. Uh, and somebody asked him, I was sitting there. So somebody asked him, sir, what is this grammar school? Why are they called grammar schools? So he said, see, you got G-R-A-M-M-A-R and G-R-A-M-A-R. There are two spellings. G-R-A-M-A-R is grammar as in English grammar. I said, what? G-R-A-M-A-R? I was already, it was like somebody 
gave me once or I, that NCC thing, you know, that chaps hitting my jaw is nothing compared to this. This was like somebody punched me in the face. G-R-A-M-A-R is the spelling of grammar. Okay. And then he goes on to say, G-R-A-M-M-A-R is grammar, which is the surname of a man who started these schools originally. So, grammar schools originally belonged to this man whose surname was Grammar. And this is the spelling. The otherwise, it's G-R-A-M-A-R. So, that is the difference. And the second one, if the first one was a punch in the face, the second one just took straight in the solar plexus. I almost died. Does anyone see the funny side of this? Anyway, grammar schools were called grammar. There is only one spelling, G-R-A-M-M-A-R. All schools initially taught grammar. They taught grammar. Why did they teach grammar? Because they thought unless you learned languages and you learned grammar, which is syntax, semantics, semiotics, unless you learned that, you will not be able to study. So the beginning of your studies is with grammar. And grammar of what languages? Grammar of Latin. That is the most prominent. But they also taught Greek grammar. They also taught Greek grammar. And then they came to English and French. Because there's a lot of French influence also. And of course, German, because I told you that the biggest influence on English is from the German language, thanks to the Angler tribe that came from the Saxony region and established their rule there. So these languages were taught in schools. Education began with grammar of all these different languages. And then you went on to study other subjects at a later juncture. Now, what, it, what beats me is that if you were teaching Greek grammar, I know that you concentrated on Latin, all right, because that is a natural thing to do since you have adopted their alphabet. The Latin alphabet is what you use. So fine, I have no issues with that. But there was a component, which is Greek grammar. Why did these people fail so miserably? Why did they fail so miserably in teaching Greek? grammar, Greek language, and Greek alphabet. There are hardly anyone, even today, there is hardly anyone in England where grammar schools are still there. They are not a thing of the past. They are very much there, even today. But nobody seems to know Greek. I don't know why. It's a very funny thing. Not in the hilarious sense. It's a... Anyway, 
So look at the confusion we have created. Kinonia politike, which is supposed to be a political society where people are enlightened and therefore are conducting poetics of conduct again, where they are conducting themselves in a particular manner. Instead of that, it has now become governmental institutions and the process of governance, which is political society. That is not what Aristotle meant by kinonia politike. He didn't mean that. So that's the reason why one has to be very, very careful when there are translations happening from other languages into English. Okay, don't blindly believe something that is there in front of you because languages are extremely nuanced and you have to you have to understand the nuances. You have to understand the nuances. And civil society was the translation of this. Because civil society, there's no polis, politia, coninia, politike. All these things have come from the word polis. The Romans didn't have a polis. The Romans didn't have a polis. And without a polis, they didn't know how to say, talk about politics, so they made it civilis. And civitas, being civil. Being civil is being polite. Again, that also indicates a poetics of conduct. But by the time it's come down to us, civil society has been through some five different meanings. And now we have political societies also. But we'll talk about them later. Okay, so actually, politia was placed here because where I put polity in brackets, Aristotle believed that politia should not be at the top, politia should be at this level. Why? Because the more number of citizens you involve, the more number of citizens you involve in the process of governance, citizens, that is the operational word, okay, then stability is higher. Stability is much, much higher. That is his belief. So, Politia was located there, and since it could not be translated into Republic, then again it will become this thing. Somebody decided to translate that into Polity in English. And like I said, it's a much later thing. Otherwise, it was becoming confusing because Aristotle, unlike Plato, went and talked about politics, the political, and all these things. And when these things happened, what happened? You see that uh, when all, what was I saying? What? Akshay, what was I saying? Aristotle. No, Aristotle, but what? What? Yeah. Uh, when the confusion 
over the terminology arose, then it became politia, became polity. That is a word that we continue to use. Now, Aristotle differed with Plato on the ideal being the real. For Aristotle, not the ideal being the real, that would be again a wrong thing. Uh, the ideal need not be, need not be perfection in the form of an idea. Yeah. Uh, why will the policy be generated into democracy? Aristotle considers this the best. Aristotle, I'm going to get to that. I haven't taught you. Aristotle creates a number of means through which he says that it will not uh, degenerate into a democracy. I'll get to that. I'm getting to that. Uh, so policy simply put, uh, for him is a rule by few for the good. A rule of the maximum possible citizens for the well-being of everyone. That is what it is. Now, there are a number of controversies about Aristotle, and you'll start understanding why I'm saying this uh, when we look at Aristotle, when we start going further into his philosophy. Okay. Yeah. So perfection in the form of an idea is not what he wants. He is looking at the Okay, so this is what he is saying. Politia is the best possible form of governance. And that is the reason why uh, Raphael painted uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, he painted uh, Plato looking at the stars and Aristotle looking at the ground. But Plato didn't believe that his form of government was unattainable. His ideal republic was unattainable. He didn't believe that. Not in the least. He didn't believe that at all. He just didn't believe that at all. Okay. And so one should not pit them against each other. Now, to understand politia in Aristotle, we have to understand his. Uh, theory 
of form. Please remember this is completely, completely different from Plato's realm of forms. A realm is a location. Forms is in plural and that is the soul. Okay. That is the soul. That is what Plato meant by the realm of the forms. And knowledge is gained in the realm of the forms. And therefore we are born with innate knowledge. We have knowledge right at the time of birth. Now, let us try to understand what is the theory of the form. In order to understand the theory of the form, you first have to understand this Aristotelian proposition. He says, everything This is what he says, everything in nature has a primary natural potential. And, well, actually I have to put it as, it will try to Okay, everything has a primary natural potential and that thing which has this will try to reach its completely or totally developed or completely finished form. Finished not as finished, as in developed, completely you say, I have finished with my work, which means that it's reached its peak. You have done whatever you can do. That's the finish, not it's finished, which means that it doesn't exist anymore. Not like that, not that finished. So that's why I put that totally developed or it should have actually been put as completely developed or totally finished. No, that'll be even worse. Anyway, so let me explain this through an example. Aristotle gives the example of
I suppose you know what an acorn is. No, sir. Uh huh. No, we don't know, sir. Okay. Well, acorn is a seed. All right. Yes, sir. Which tree? I will tell you later. I can't tell you that now. The seed of a particular tree is called an acorn. If you look at the acorn, okay, it is oblong. You know what is oblong, right? Pointed at both ends and becoming like this. So the acorn looks oblong. It is swollen in the middle, tapering to the ends, flattish. And if you take that acorn, show it to Aristotle, and ask him, what is the form of this seed that I have? Well, when we talk about form, what is it that we talk about? We talk about the appearance. How does it appear? So there are two possible answers. One thing when you show that to him, or oh, there are three possible answers. One is he can say, this seems to be a seed of some tree. Or he can say, uh, this is an acorn, if he knows what an acorn is. Or he can say, this is something which is oblong, a, a bit swollen in the middle and flattened out towards the ends. Right? He could give you any of these three answers. He doesn't give you any of these three answers. He says, if you show an egg on to him, he says, this is this is his answer. I suppose you know oak trees, right? It's a kind yes. of a tree. Yeah. The seed of an acorn is, uh, sorry, of an oak tree is called an acorn. And please don't write A-K-O and I can't stand that fellow. Hmm. Nah. So, acorn is the primary natural potential. And what is its finished form? The finished form is the oak tree. So Aristotle says you never identify a form at the level of the primary natural potential. Never identify the form at the level of the primary natural potential. You have to go to the finished form. So, if you see, even if you are not specific, somebody gives you a seed, some seed, you don't know what seed that is. Your answer to that will be, this will be either a plant or a tree is its form. Okay, that is what he would say. He would say it would either be a plant 
or a tree of some variety that is its form so this is his theory of form and it has everything to do with this proposition that the everything has a primary natural potential and has to reach tries to reach its full form totally developed form sorry okay now please remember not all seeds seeds will become trees all right yes, sir. not all babies that are born of any different animals in the animal kingdom fewer babies survive more number of babies die right so not all of them reach the full form or the developed form or the fully developed form not all reach that that is also true of human beings but aristotle says that should shouldn't stop you from getting to the politia for him politia is the finished form so i'm actually going in the reverse politia is the finished form and what do you find in politia so you the you demonia which can also be translated into peace and tranquility it can be all these it can be happiness that's the beauty of greek language second only to sanskrit but sanskrit is the greatest language in the world which is not something i'm saying i'm not saying this the greatest linguistic philosophers even noam chomsky believes that the brevity the brief ness of expression brevity of expression that you can have in sanskrit is totally unmatched and uh, an indologist patricia novolari she studied madhvacharya's writings which are extremely pithy apparently in sanskrit and she says that that kind of usage such i mean so few words but loaded with so many meanings she says is only possible in sanskrit and madhvacharya seem to have 
mastered Sanskrit better than Shankaracharya and Ramanujacharya and all those people. That's what she says. He's known to have written the briefest commentaries, but the most profoundly meaningful. That's the beauty of the Sanskrit language. The Greek language is a bit like that. Eudaimonia. Just imagine how many things it is saying. How many things it is saying. So that is politia is the Finnish form and that has to have eudaimonia. Only when it has eudaimonia is it the Finnish form. The question then is what is the primary natural potential? For him, the primary natural potentiality of human society is the sociability of human beings. But that's not the end. When he said, man is a social animal, when he said that, he didn't make a statement about finality. He was not saying man is a social animal and leaving at that. That is not where he would identify the human potential. I mean, this is where he identifies the human potential, but not the finished form. The finished form of that is man is a political animal. That we shall do tomorrow. If you have any doubts about this, you can ask me in the evening. Because it's already 10.40. So you can ask me in the evening. Let me say bye-bye to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.